Hi, everyone. Um, this is super exciting that the organizers were able to move this so quickly into a virtual meeting. I'm super impressed. And so um, I'm really excited because I was looking forward to, uh, to presenting and speaking with all of you. Um, my name is Jane, and um, uh, I am founder of the Aperta Project, among a couple of other things. So I mentioned in my intro in the chat that I work in people ops. Um, so I've worked in HR people ops in a bunch of industries for about 15 years, and I'm currently at a digital agency. Um, and I, um, I'm also currently a, a graduate student. Um, and I'm studying um, human systems intervention, which is basically, oops, which is basically um, looking at how to uh, support participatory change in systems, whether that is uh, organizations or communities. All right, give me two seconds. I just want to move my chat so it's not hanging out here. Awesome. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about, uh, about a Aperta project and everyone always asks what Aperta means and so I thought I would just start with that. Uh, so it, it's a Latin word and um, I just really uh, felt that it was apropos for this project. It basically means uh, free, public, open, uncovered, um, a cloudless sky. So um, this project began in 2017. Um, when I was working at a tech startup and the Me Too movement really sort of hit the mainstream. So we saw stories from Weinstein and a lot of, um, a lot of tech companies actually in the US. Uh, and I was reflecting at that time on, on my own experience as uh, someone who worked in human resources and people ops and just how very intractable this problem seemed. Uh, of sexual harassment in the workplace. And I, I sort of wondered why that was. So many things had changed about the way we work. And yet this one uh, didn't seem to have attracted sort of any innovation or, or change or, or new thinking over the years. And so I knew I wanted to do something about that. Um, and I was reflecting very much on my own profession's role in uh, perpetuating the status quo in that area. And so at the time I was doing a lot of writing and speaking about this topic and people started approaching me with their own experiences and their own stories and that sort of snowballed. So I, I spoke to a few people and they would connect me with other people that I should speak with who were either interested in this topic or had you know, their own experiences to share. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that because I met a ton of really wonderful people. Um, but what really became apparent to me through those conversations and hearing people's stories was the big gap that existed between how organizations typically conceive of the problem of workplace sexual harassment and on the other side how people were actually experiencing that behavior and though that was a big difference and so i realized that the problem that we thought we were solving was not actually the problem and i wondered what i could do about that and so just to pause for a second and, and share a couple of stats with you to, uh, to speak to sort of the impact that this issue has on our current workplaces. So these are all Canadian recent stats. So in 2018, 52% um, of women, Canadian women in the workplace reported that they'd experienced sexual harassment at some point in their career. 22% of men reported the same, which is a stat that sometimes surprises people, but I've certainly spoken to a lot of men who have experienced that in the workplace. And 40% of Canadians in 2018 said that there was some or a lot of sexual harassment currently in their workplace, which is quite staggering, I think. And the challenge is that uh, not only did I notice that there was this gap between what we thought the problem was and what the problem actually was, um, there was really uh, a resistance to recognizing the extent of this challenge that organizations face. So this is, again, Pretty recent, 2017, 93% of Canadian CEOs said that sexual harassment was not a problem in their organization. And 70% of uh, HR folks say that they do a really good job handling sexual harassment in the workplace. So there's something to me that just really doesn't add up there. And finally, my last stat that I'm going to share with you tonight is that reporting is really uncommon. So only about 30% of workplace sexual harassment gets reported in the workplace even though really all of the current strategies and interventions that we have to deal with this issue kind of rest on this assumption that reporting is the norm, uh, but it's really not. 
So uh, there's lots of reasons for that. I don't really have time to go into those this evening, um, but that number has been quite consistent for some time. So that brings me to what my objective for this project ended up being, and that was to bring employees' voices into the conversation about this issue in order to devise more effective interventions. So the idea was to try to close that gap between how organizations, leaders, HR people conceive of this problem and how people actually experience it so that we could ideally focus on solving the real problem rather than um, going through these sort of reactive motions that are that are typical of, uh, of most organization response to this, this topic. So that was my goal and I chose to focus on Toronto Tech as a community. And I did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was that I worked in tech at the time. Um, and so I was hearing from a lot of both um, employees who worked in tech who were experiencing or witnessing harassment, but also from my peers in HR or people ops and, and just how ill-equipped they were to sort of handle this type of systemic issue. And I love this quote from uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Kaplan. She's uh, head of the Gender and the Economy Group at Rahman University. And uh, just really captures, I think, the opportunity that tech faces in Toronto. There's so much growth, there's so much innovation, there's so much talent that is being drawn in um, that I just think that it presents a tremendous chance for us to really design a more inclusive tech sector to learn from mistakes of you know, Silicon Valley and, and potentially other industries that, that really haven't bothered to pay too much attention to, um, to really creating safe and inclusive workplaces. So this was my plan, and I will share with you how the plan um, deviated, but this was the plan. So I partnered with two researchers that were associated with the Kenevan Center for the Applied Study of Complexity. Uh, they're based in Wales. And so I partnered with an anthropologist and a data scientist who were really interested in this, in this topic as well. And we used a tool that their, um, their uh, consulting arm, which is called Cognitive Edge, we used a tool uh, that is intended to actually basically provide the means to do distributed ethnography. And what I mean by that is that ethnographic study is usually one person observing a group or doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. And their tech tool was designed to collect stories from people, but instead of um, it being like a survey or a questionnaire, it invites the respondents to basically analyze their own response. So it asks them to um, amplify what is meaningful in the stories that they are sharing and to um, pinpoint what they feel the causal factors underlying the, the story that they're providing. So this has been used um, in a lot of international development projects and some governance work. And I was really attracted to the idea that this would be a very um, uh, unique and, and potentially very like innovative approach to exploring this issue. So we, we launched the, uh, the, the uh, tool is called SenseMaker. We launched that um, in the late spring last year uh, over the summer. And uh, that was with the intent to collect first person stories. We also collected some uh, demographic data that was intended to allow for an intersectional analysis. So we were looking to find out uh, more about respondents' uh, gender identity, their uh, sexual orientation, their racial identity, and their immigration status to understand how those factors may influence whether they experienced harassment and also how they responded. So whether they reported it and how they made sense of their experience. And the intent was to have a feedback session to share some of those stories and data with a cross-section of tech ecosystem stakeholders. And by that, I mean um, folks who are in a decision-maker uh, decision capacity and also uh, employees from a range of different, um, different groups and, and sort of uh, professions within the tech sector with the goal of inviting them to co-design different pilots and experiments that might improve prevention and response to experiences of workplace sexual harassment. And then the idea would be to create a bit of a hub, a bit of a community for people to share information and learn from those pilots and iterate from them to increase the effectiveness of these interventions. But what ended up happening, which was uh, somewhat unexpected, was that many of my learnings uh, were not from the data we collected, but rather uh, the way that people responded to the method of data collection. And so the feedback session that's listed here as step three has not yet taken place. So my key learnings with this uh, 
one was that at the outset of the project, I was very much relying on word of mouth to get the word out about this project. And I did approach a number of organizations and community partners that were focused on diversity and inclusion in tech. Uh, but it wasn't always clear to them how sexual harassment connected to those efforts. And there was often a, I, my perception was that there was often a resistance to inviting people to share stories of when things had gone wrong, rather than focused on how things could go right in the future. To me, those things are linked, but that was a challenge in getting the word out. And then the other challenge was that um, there was real trade-offs with using technology to collect these first person accounts. And by that, I mean that when you're asking someone to share something sensitive, on the one hand, anonymity can be a major selling point. And on the other hand, um, it's very difficult to ask people to sit with and relive a story on their own in front of a computer without having any kind of empathy or emotional support. And so what I found was that when people share their story with me firsthand, which many, many people have in the last couple of years, they're getting um, one, my, my presence and my empathy, and also they're often having a sense of validation that what they're describing in terms of like their organization's response is common and I can help make them make sense of that. Um, and so that doesn't happen when you ask somebody to fill out uh, a story online. Um, the other thing that I learned, which was really fascinating, was because we asked for a story, a lot of people were paralyzed and they couldn't pick one thing. Um, they said in many cases, and this is representative of the experience of harassment, is that it's often an escalation over time of um, people uh, violating one's boundaries rather than one particular incident. And so when I was asking them for a story, they couldn't necessarily pick just one particular incident that would encapsulate their experience. Um, and so they didn't uh, share a story. And lastly, the thing that was really, uh, really interesting to me and, and quite challenging was that I encountered frequently um, in men and women and a whole variety of uh, ages and, and demographics was that people really minimize their own experience. And it's, it's sort of the double edged sword of Me Too in a way is that people would say, well, nothing that happened to me was anything like what happened with the Weinstein story or well, I know that things happen to people, but what happened to me wasn't really a big deal. Um, and so how do you collect information and stories uh, about sexual harassment if people decline to label their experience sexual harassment, even though when they share their story with me in person, it's very, very clearly uh, meeting the threshold for sexual harassment. So, so that's an interesting challenge I'm still grappling with. So that brings me to present day. Um, or as close to present day as I could. I had to change this given the uh, social distancing that we're all currently engaged in. Um, so I've continued to collect stories, whether uh, using SenseMaker online, there's been a few people who are, are happy to continue using that channel, or people who wish to share their story with me um, as part of a face-to-face, uh, -face, um, or now Zoom face-to-face -face, um, ethnographic interview to collect the, the relevant data. Um, and I've been exploring arts-based methods to connect, uh, connect ecosystem stakeholders to these stories. And by that, I mean using something like playback theater, which is essentially a performing group that can um, act out in real time the stories that I'm collecting to provide a sense of connection and understanding to, to help bridge that gap again between the understanding that we currently have of this problem and the actual complexity of the experience that people have when this happens. So that's on hold for now, but I'm hoping to pick that up um, when things calm down and go back to normal as, I, as I'm continuing to hope they will. And then work with focus groups to co-design these interventions. So this is a major focus of my master's degree is focusing on systems change. This was my um, driving force to go back to, to do that. That, uh, that degree was to, to try to understand how um, a systems lens can can potentially increase our effectiveness at trying to prevent this type of uh, issue in organizations. So I will close out with um, just saying that I'm I'm wide open to how anyone can help. If you are interested in hearing more, I'm never sad about talking about this topic because I think that that is a huge part is, is increasing people's awareness about um, you know what this. Uh, problem actually looks like on the ground. If you uh, 
have any ideas or if you know somebody that I should meet, I always welcome introductions or conversations. So um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch. Um, and I just, I've put a quote in here uh, because I think this is so important and this is what really drives me forward is thinking about um, how things can look different in the future. I think that it really means that we have to understand the challenges that we face now. And I'll pause there and see if you have any questions for me. I'm very happy to uh, to answer any of those. Thank you. All right. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. Hi, I'm Sarah. I have a question. Uh, sorry, I don't have my video chat on. Okay. I can do that for a minute. How's it going? Okay, hi. So um, I was wondering, so when you're looking for participants, like are you looking for people specifically in the tech sector or just kind of more uh, general anywhere? Yeah. Or? Great question. No, I am, I am specifically for this project focused on the tech sector. This was intended to be, uh, Sarah, kind of a pilot for us. Mm -hmm. And potentially, um, yes, there's lots of folks who have been in touch who have said, can you do this industry next and um, you know maybe maybe we'll get there but yeah makes sense okay that's good to know thanks thank you any other questions oh hello uh, my name is Ananya um, I was just curious what art based methods you would use um, to share the stories yeah, so um, Ananya, I'm, I'm really interested in potentially using something called playback theater, um, which you may or may not have heard of. And essentially playback theater is, uh, it is a group of actors and there's actually a, a theater troupe here in Toronto, if you Google playback theater Toronto, and they provide their services as a theater troupe for all kinds of um, purposes. One thing that they often do is uh, they're used for training doctors. Um, to interact with patients more effectively. And so they might act out a situation that a doctor would face in their day-to-day -day practice. So they would act as like a patient. And so my, my thought was that it would be very, very helpful to, for people to, to actually be um, almost immersed in these experiences, the stories that I'm collecting, so that it becomes far more clear about the power dynamics that exist in these situations, which is, which is something that it doesn't always come through when we just talk about them. And certainly when um, traditional organizational training on this topic, it, it's very two dimensional and it, it erases some of the complexity and nuance that exists that makes these situations so difficult to address. Yeah, um, yeah so that was, that was my thought from an arts-based standpoint. Oh, that's, that's a really great idea. Thank you. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Jane, um, you're gonna be collecting a lot of uh, pretty interesting data, I imagine, uh, and a lot of it's gonna be pretty, as you said, the situations are very complicated, and I was just wondering, um, how you were gonna, how you're expecting to analyze the data and uh, what about the tech sector you might be finding um, in terms of like sort of explanatory factors, mm. if that's uh, something you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's a great question. There is quite a lot of existing literature out there, not specific to the tech sector, but more generally about um, systemic conditions within organizations that might contribute to the likelihood of harassment arising. And so that's something, so in my day job, uh, working in people apps, I do you know, training on this topic and I've incorporated a lot of that research into the approach that I take. Um, but there is also, I think, specific factors within um, tech as an industry and then certainly variations between organizations. So I was trying to get down to that level. So some of the questions that we asked in um, our, our survey tool were asking um, respondents about their perception of their organization's level of tolerance and stance towards harassment and other antisocial behaviors. 
um, because often that is a major driver of how likely someone is to report. Um, we also looked for um, you know, other, uh, other conditions like um, the degree to which there was um, uh, gender diversity within their organization, which is also sort of a, a, re a relatively well-established risk factor for uh, whether harassment is likely to occur. And then we asked them um, also about their uh, organization's um, espoused commitment to diversity and inclusion, which we thought might be interesting to analyze with respect to um, how people reacted uh, if harassment did occur. Can I ask a follow-up? Please. It, it seems kind of interesting because I, I think you hinted to this in your presentation when you were contacting groups uh, in Toronto who had diversity and inclusion as a focus and you mentioned that they didn't necessarily um, see that as being aligned with um, prevention of sexual and prevention and handling of sexual harassment in the workplace is your like could you talk more about the kind of uh divide like no, i don't know how to say divide but like where the nuances existed in between those kinds of uh i don't know initiatives or focuses that your research has come up with because i think it's just an interesting thing to kind of decouple yeah, and I, you know, I'm not a DNI expert, so by any stretch of the imagination. So I, I, I do want to preface this by just saying that this is, you know, largely hypothesis on my my uh, part. But I think that I think that um, diversity and inclusion, as it's currently discussed in most industries, so this is not tech specific, is. Um, it's often quite superficial, and so we are still thinking largely about um, diversity, and 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 we're not we're thinking about uh, employer branding often as organizations, like how we can talk about being diverse, because I think you know the the case is there and people see it, but there's a lot less. Um, from my own experience, there's a lot less understanding and willingness to really explore like the systemic changes that you need to make, the structural changes in your organization to make it truly inclusive. And by that, I mean like really um, uh, investigating like the biases that are built into a lot of the processes that our organizations have when it comes to recruitment and promotion and um, just lots of lots of things like day to day. And so when I think organizations talk about diversity and inclusion and making progress. It's a very complex, it's a wicked problem to solve. And so when they're making progress on like attracting more um, diverse employees, then to ask them to sort of start talking about sexual harassment, I think can feel like a step backwards or that it's dissonant in a way. Um, from my perspective, it absolutely isn't. You can't be saying that you want to attract more women into tech and then not looking at harassment because that you, you could, you know, if you're not solving that, you're really bringing people into an organization that may actually ultimately cause them harm. Um, so I don't know, that's like my, my gobbledygook answer, but, but yeah, I just think that it's, it's just really, really hard to actually solve a lot of this stuff. And it's a lot easier to talk about the commitment, the intention to diversity and inclusion. Well, thanks for your answer. Hey, Jane. Um, I might just steal this last question in here, because um, I can. Uh, so a lot of the data you're collecting, it's, it is more uh, qualitative. Uh, yes. um, and it's a lot of like storytelling and stuff like that. Are there any methods you're using, um, whether in like user research or like uh, grounded theory about how to code that information? And are you looking at any ways to visualize that later? Yeah, so this would actually be a great question for one of my collaborators um, uh, who is uh, a data scientist. So um, there, there's sort of a two-part answer that's, that's probably quite superficial on my part, but uh, really the intent of this tool is to allow some of the data, most of the data analysis to be done by the respondent. And it's, um, I, I wish that I'd grab a, grab a screenshot of it because I realized that was an oversight, but essentially what we do ask people is to um, indicate the the relative weight of factors that they feel contributed to their experience and to some of their responses which really helps us make sense of their responses versus like um, 
like uh, injecting our own bias into interpreting interpreting their responses. Um, but you're right, it is all qualitative. This is a qualitative uh, project that is focused on on people's experiences and their stories. Um, so that data analysis would would be in part done by respondents, and then my colleague would um, would perform uh, the rest of the data analysis, particularly around demographics and the intersectional data that we were presenting uh, collecting, and um, and then yeah, there's some heat maps that are generated by there's uh, when we ask them to to indicate the relative weight that different factors have uh, placed have have uh, factored in to what they experienced. For example, there's it's a triad. And so they have to position a stone within the triad. And so you start seeing some really interesting patterns emerge from how people respond. So it's a really neat tool. I, I just, um, as I say, it's such an interesting trade-off with technology when you're uh, trying to collect this kind of data. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, if anyone else has questions, Jane, uh, are you on the Civic Tech Toronto Slack by any chance? Am I on the what? The Civic Tech Toronto Slack group? I'm going to be by the okay. end of this evening. All right. Um, yeah, so feel free, you'll be landed in a channel called uh, hashtag general. So feel free to uh, just put a note in there telling people that they can reach out if they have other questions, if that's okay with you. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Round of applause um, for Jane in any way we can. Thank you so much. <laughs>